What is up guys, welcome back to the channel. It's a beautiful Sunday afternoon here in San Diego. And the purpose of today's video is to look at things I consider when designing an anterior crown. This is gonna be a little bit different than my other videos because I'm gonna keep it super long format so that you'll be able to scrub through the footage from the beginning of the crown preparation all the way to the impression. I think that provides the most value for those of you out there that are trying to uh, perfect their crown preparation designs. Also, I'm gonna be focusing on how to create really crispy, sharp, well-defined margins, how to make your crown preparation very smooth and how to work efficiently so that your patient's very happy at the end of the day. My philosophy is that if you spend a little extra time perfecting your crown preparation, then your assistant will do a better job with their temporary crown, the laboratory will do a better job fabricating uh, the porcelain crown, and ultimately when you cement the crown, you'll have really flush, smooth margins that hopefully last a very long time for the patient. So let's jump right into the video. As I was talking, we already started the facial reduction as well as working a little bit on the margins of the tooth. I like to combine both of these steps together because it helps me really perfect that crispy margin that we're trying to achieve uh, by the end of the crown preparation design. We also need to have a discussion about why we chose to do an anterior crown versus an anterior veneer. When we're weighing our options about whether to do a veneer or a crown, I like to consider the most important factor for a veneer, which is the amount of enamel left over after preparing the tooth. As you can see, this patient already has a large buccal composite that takes up a little bit less than one half of the facial surface of the tooth. The bond strength to that composite resin versus the bond strength to pure enamel is much less. So ideally, we wanna have a lot of enamel on the facial surface of the tooth for a veneer to be even more successful and have strong bonding capabilities. Also, when you're considering designing a veneer, you have to think about what color change you're doing. If you're trying to go from a very dark color to a lighter color veneer, meaning if the tooth is already very dark to begin with, then you have to design the veneer a little bit more aggressively. So after talking about this with our patient, we gave him both options and he decided that the best option would be an anterior crown. Now you can notice here that I take a slow speed round burr that runs on a slower RPM. Uh, I start teasing away the cavity a little bit at a time and I make sure that I have hard sound tooth structure and that all the cavity is completely removed. At this point, I like to place a cord and, and typically I place as large of a cord as possible. In this particular video, I believe it's a number two cord that wraps around the entire gums. And I place the cord now because of two reasons. Number one, as I place the cord, the gingiva around the tooth uh, pushes out of the way. And you'd be surprised how much tooth structure you'll see and you're able to prep once you move that tissue out of the way. Sometimes you can get two or even three millimeters of extra length to the tooth for added retention. This really helps with teeth that have short clinical crown lengths to begin with, like the second molars in the back of the mouth, where you want a little bit of that axial wall height for added retention. Of course, if you're bonding your crown to the tooth, you don't need that retention, but I'm still a believer of mechanical retention to support the tooth um, uh, in, in order to have a stable crown for as long as possible. I would mention that some people prefer to pack two cords, uh, meaning a double zero cord, and then a, another cord on top of that to move the gums out of the way for a better impression. And I actually do agree with that. In this particular case, I only packed one cord and it was enough for me to achieve 
um, a really nice impression, which you'll see at the end. But if you decide to go the other route, you can do that as well. Now, some dentists do like to use the cavity preparation as part of the crown design, and I see no fault in that. Uh, in this particular case, I wanted to fill the cavity with composite resin. So as you can see here, I use, um, I, use I believe, Clear Fill SC Protect, uh, placed a primer, dried it out, placed my bonding agent, dried it out, cured, and then I placed a little bit of flowable composite to fill in that void in the tooth. Is that absolutely necessary? I don't think so, but I wanted a really clean design for the video, so here it is. So notice how I'm really taking my time with this crown preparation. I'm trying not to nick the tissue at all because I don't want a bloody mess and I'm making sure everything is really smooth. If the crown preparation is entirely smooth, then the dental laboratory has an easier time fabricating that porcelain crown and during the cementation appointment, it just slips right in and you have nice contacts. When you have sharp edges to your crown preparation, that's when dentists and lab technicians run into problems. So I definitely encourage you to take your time to smoothen everything out and really polish the restoration to make it look as nice as possible. So I want to make a few notes about the final impression. Um, I'm carrying the light body and my assistant is carrying the heavy body. Of course, we check the occlusal clearance. Uh, we try in the tray in the mouth a couple times to make sure the patient is biting down in the right way. You'd be surprised how many times a patient, when their mouth is open this long, forget how to bite on their back teeth. And that's not their fault, that's something that you have to remind them to have, have them bite in the right occlusion. When you have a cord packed in there, as long as I have it packed in there, it can dry out. And you don't want to lift the cord up when it's dry. Because when it's really dry, it can tear the tissue. And when it tears the tissue, guess what? You have a lot of bleeding, and then you have to control the bleeding with either astringent or you have to repack another cord. So make sure to uh, moisten the cord a bit and then slowly tease it away. You can evaluate if you have any bleeding sites, place astringent as necessary, dry it up the best way you can, and then you're gonna use that light body to go around the tooth in a very slow manner. I like to start at the margin and I slowly work my way to the top and then you place the tray in, have them bite down. Typically the setting time, uh, we wait about five minutes, take it out and then your assistant will finish the provisional crown. So that's all I recorded for you guys today. Uh, I hope this helps any of you out there that are trying to learn different techniques about crown preparation design. If you have any questions or comments, leave it down below. Please like, subscribe, support the channel. And you know, one note, uh, I'm thinking about doing a series, a 10 part video series where my wife and I go into how to design a practice. Uh, we're in the process right now of expanding our office into a new space. Uh, we made decisions about whether to lease or buy and a lot of other business decisions. And please let me know if that's something you're interested in listening to and we'll get to work making a video series on that. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you for the next one.